Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. Think of all that has changed as a result of startups and creative destruction. Everything from the phone to the camera to transportation to travel to banking. Nothing is the same as it was because of the sometimes revolutionary ideas of entrepreneurs. In a similar way, the 1960s were a time of creative destruction for America and for the world, really. The post-war paradigm that had shaped the country through the late 40s and early 50s was shattered. And just as today, we are still struggling socially, politically, and economically to come to grips with our technological disruption. On a grander scale, we are still trying to come to grips with the social and political upheaval of the 60s. It may be the fundamental reprogramming of our DNA in the 60s that has created today's division. If so, then getting back to basics, to the core ideas of what the 60s represented and how it really changed us and what it really represents seems like it should be job one in order to go forward. That shattering is what we're going to talk about today with my guest, Kevin Boyle. Kevin Boyle is the National Book Award winning author of Arc of Justice and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He is the William Smith Mason Professor of American History at Northwestern, and his newest book is The Shattering, America in the 60s. Kevin Boyle, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. A delight to have you here. In so many ways, when we talk about the 60s, we tend to think of it in, in a kind of sui generis way, as if the 60s existed unto itself. One of the things you point out is that it's so important to understand what came before the world the way it was in the post-war years and through the 50s. Talk about that. Sure. So we have, a, I think a lot of people have a picture of the 1950s in particular as a moment of national consensus, as a moment when we all agreed on what the nation should be. And one of the things that I think is really important to recognize is that two things, really, that the 1950s was a moment of security and stability for a swath of the nation, uh, middle class, white, and the upper end of the working class had a level of security that was really striking. It was really remarkable, but it was a swath of the nation. A lot of other people were excluded from that. And um, that it was a new thing, that the people, American people, had lived through such sweeping changes, so many challenges, a Great Depression, a world war, that that sense of security, even for that portion of the nation that enjoyed it, and it was a bigger portion than ever before, was a new thing. It was a fragile thing. And then the 60s came to break that open. And talk about the earliest ways in which you saw those cracks evolve, the way in which the cracks ultimately led to the shattering. What were the earliest signs? I think there were three major cracks, and that the earliest signs of those really came with the civil rights movement. There had been a long, long civil rights movement in the United States. It's one of the premises of the book that the civil rights movement didn't create it when Rosa Parks refuses to give up her seat on a bus in 1955. It's been a long civil rights movement pushing for, at least the main portion of that civil rights movement, pushing for inclusion, the opportunity for African Americans to be treated as equal citizens. And that really started to crack open in the mid 1950s. It started to crack open in a legal sense with the Brown versus Board of Education decision from the Supreme Court started to crack open with the intensifying protests in the South. There had been protests before, but they intensified with the Montgomery bus boycott. With Little Rock in 1957 was a huge issue, much bigger than the Montgomery bus boycott at the time, when African Americans were insisting that they wanted the oper- they wanted the country to live up to its promises of equal rights. And to what extent did other movements either start spontaneously or piggyback onto the civil rights movement? When we look at the women's movement, the sexual revolution, et cetera, to what extent were they in some ways outgrowths of the civil rights movement? I think that you used exactly the right word, that they piggybacked on the civil rights movement. Now, there were, and I'm really glad you brought up the women's movement, there were fundamental changes going on in 
the American kind of sexual culture as well. And the key one really was a technological one, which was the introduction and widespread distribution of the birth control pill in the late 1950s and early 1960s. That's a fundamental change in American sexual practices, the possibility of sexual practices. And that then opened up um, challenges to the cultural construction and the legal construction of the nation's sexual practices. But the movement that emerged out of that, the anti-war movement of the 1960s is another perfect example, build on the momentum and the model that the civil rights movement created, that the civil rights movement broke open American political life in a way that other groups then built on. Were there leaders, politicians at the time, or leaders in any sector for that matter, that, that you've uncovered that saw this coming, that had a sense of what we were on the precipice of? That's a wonderful question. I think it's, that's a great question. I think what makes it a little tricky is that it's always easy to look back and say, ah, these people saw it coming. And I think it's a little more that there were people who were in the leadership positions driving forward social change. So someone like, say, um, Martin Luther King, obvious, a really obvious example, or some of the other major figures of the civil rights movement who don't get the attention they deserve, Ella Baker or Bayard Rustin. There were individuals, and one of the things that's so important to me to think about the 1960s is ordinary people who were driving these changes because they wanted to build a better nation. And one of the things that I try to do in the book is I try to bring up those stories of ordinary people, some of them utterly obscure people, some of them who became better known, people like Estelle Griswold, who um, led the legal challenge to the restrictions the government restrictions on birth control. And then there were people, and there weren't a huge number of them, but some of I think the most important of them was Lyndon Johnson, who understood that the change was coming and the change was here and that he wanted to be in front of it. And one of the tragedies of Lyndon Johnson's history is that he managed to do that remarkably with the civil rights revolution and disastrously with foreign policy. Talk a little bit about the ways in which these things were able to happen, both with respect to ordinary people and on the larger framework you've been talking about, that they were able to happen sometimes quietly, sometimes individually, and grow organically. It was a way that things seemed to evolve that was so different, so much in contrast to the the 24-7 media landscape that we have today. It's hard to imagine these things happening in the environment that we have today. Yeah, I think that's really a fascinating point. I'll give you an example that really comes to mind from the book um, that I think is a really nice illustration of that. I mentioned just a minute ago Estelle Griswold. Estelle Griswold was the head of the executive director of the Connecticut branch of Planned Parenthood, so the leading organization in America that promoted birth control. And Connecticut was an odd state in that Connecticut, for almost 100 years, had outlawed, it was against the law in the state of Connecticut, for anyone to sell or distribute or use any form of birth control. Now, this was a law that basically nobody much enforced. But Planned Parenthood, for understandable reasons, wanted it purged from the books. And they tried for decades to get it purged from the books. And they couldn't because no one really wanted to be bother in the Connecticut State Legislature to eliminate a law that no one actually enforced. And so what Estelle Griswold decided to do in the early 1960s was to get herself arrested for breaking that law. And what she did is she opened in New Haven, Connecticut, 1961, a birth control clinic to distribute birth control information to married people. It never occurred to her that she was going to distribute these to anyone but married people. And the whole thing was meant to get her arrested, which it did. She got arrested under this law. 
under weird circumstances. And from that arrest, she then built a Supreme Court test case that finally reached the Supreme Court in 1965, Griswold versus Connecticut. And in 1965, the Supreme Court used that case to create an entirely new right for the American people in the United States, the right to privacy. Out of her test case came the right to privacy. There was no right to privacy in the United States until that ruling. When that ruling was handed down in 1965, it didn't even make the top headlines in the next day's newspapers. It was on the front page. I'm not saying it wasn't on the front page, but it was below the fold. That's unimaginable today, that something so fundamental, something that we continue to argue over and in the most bitter of terms to this day, came out of that level of obscurity, out of this ordinary woman mounting a single legal challenge that reached the Supreme Court with nobody really paying much attention. The other thing that that happened with such frequency during this period that it certainly got attention, but again, it's hard to imagine it in today's context, was how much violence was going on. Yeah, and that is something that there's a sort of nostalgia that runs through an awful lot of the, our, our understanding of the 1960s mm-hmm. of this kind of fun golden age right. of liberation. And one of the things that I think is important for us to remember is the horrific level of violence in the 1960s, official violence. So, you know, the kind of classic pictures we some of us at least have in our heads of police officers um, spraying school children with fire hoses in Birmingham, Alabama, of the Alabama state troopers beating civil rights protesters on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, political violence, the assassinations of the president of the United States, of the leading civil rights figure in the United States, of a presidential candidate in Robert Kennedy, Um, The violence of the urban upheavals of 1965, 66, 67, Watts, Newark, Detroit. It was an era of extraordinary, horrific violence. We talk about January 6th today. I mean, they were explosions that took place at the Capitol at the time. Bombs planted there. Yes. So this and the violence, that's a really important point to bring up. And that violence actually accelerated over the course of the 1960s. It was horrific in the early 60s, I think, to this day when I I teach American history. And to this day, when I talk to my classes about the um, murder of four children in Birmingham in 1963 and the Birmingham church bombing, I choke up every time. But the violence actually accelerated in the the late 1960s. And the violence of the anti-war movement as it's a portion of the anti-war movement as it swung to its more violent phases, um, the violence of racial conflict. It was a period of really remarkable um, and very disturbing violence. The other part of it was that it didn't happen in a vacuum, that there was substantial pushback to all of this, in some cases reflected in with the violence we've talked about, but also political pushback, which really gave rise to a, 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 a new conservative movement at the time. Yeah, and that is one of the things that I think as, as historians um, we need to stress and have stressed more in recent years. The 1960s was a period of society opening up in fundamental and important ways. And again, to come back to the civil rights movement is a really good example of that. Civil rights movement did achieve remarkable things in the course of the 1960s. But the political trajectory of the United States, the 1960s ended with the election of Richard Nixon. It it ended with the rise, though, of George Wallace as to Nixon's right, as a kind of populist, conservative populism that looked an awful lot like the conservative populism that we see in the United States today. You know, one of the um, analogies are always difficult and always fraught. So, but I've been struck, or I was struck over the last five years, the number of times that commentators would compare the Trump presidency to the Nixon presidency. Well, that doesn't work. Nixon presidency was a lot more complicated 
than that comparison suggests. But there is a comparison to be made with George Wallace. That's the politics that we see more of a run through in our in some of our current politics. George Wallace was a very popular figure in the late 1960s. This was a point where the breakthroughs happened in the 1960s, and they were important breakthroughs, but also where there was a very strong conservative response. It was a complicated conservative response, but there was a very strong conservative response. When Richard Nixon won the presidency, won re-election in 1972, he carried 49 states. That's not the kind of liberal breakthrough of the 1960s that we often have in our heads. That is a response to the shattering of that 1950s world. Does it surprise you as a historian in looking at other eras and other changes, other inflection points in American history, that this is still going on 60-plus years later? You know, it doesn't. Because I think if there is one bedrock idea that we as historians work from, it's that um, everything has a long history. So in my mind, as I mentioned earlier, the civil rights movement stretched back long before the 1960s. And in a similar sense, some of the conflicts we live with today have very long histories. We can't understand our profound conflicts over abortion today which are now reaching another inflection point without going all the way back to Estelle Griswold and that court case that I was talking about a little while before. It's been a long history. What happened in Afghanistan this summer, that last kind of um, rush to leave Afghanistan, had enormous echoes of what happened in Vietnam in the 1960s. People were talking about nation building in Vietnam in the late 1950s, more in the early 1960s, much the same way that we were talking about nation building, transforming Afghanistan after September 11th. History plays out in the, and not saying there's a direct line, it's not a, world, the world is a complicated place and the past is a complicated place, but that there are connections doesn't surprise me because history has a way of defining our present. And in many ways, though, one would think, or I guess one would hope, that these issues over time would reach some kind of of resolution or some kind of stasis. And in fact, because of the external environment in which all this operates in today, these issues have become worse, more pronounced. Yes. And I think that we have, I agree with you, I think that we haven't as a society really grappled with the profound changes in the media landscape and our communication systems that have had that have a way of accelerating our conflicts and exaggerating our conflicts. I don't think we've come to an understanding of how those changes have changed have um, filtered through our society in so many ways. I think your point from earlier is a really wonderful point. Try to imagine what the 60s would have looked like in today's communication world. It would have been fundamentally um, different, and I think even more intense than it was. And I don't think we as a society have grappled with that. Exactly. I mean, it's 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 really hard to even get one's head around because it would it would seemingly tear the country apart today, even more so than than people talk about. Yeah, I think one of the things that is so hard um, for all of us and for human beings in general is when you live in the midst of a revolutionary age, which I believe we really are at the moment. You don't. You can't get your head around it. Yeah, you can't quite grasp what's happening around you. And part of the job of historians, right, is to try to give us some perspective on those moments when in the past when that has happened as well. I think in the midst of the 1960s, an awful lot of ordinary people had no sense of where this country was going, had no sense of these dramatic changes flying around them. And only in retrospect do we put some sort of kind of order on them. And I think we're living in an equally revolutionary age, not the same revolutionary age, but I think we're living in an equally one, perhaps even a more profound one. The other aspect of it, when we think about it, 
as it's evolving today is, is generational change because so many of the leaders that are dealing with these issues today are people mm-hmm. in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that were very yeah. much a part of this generation. Yeah, I think that is a wonderful point. It is a really compelling and um, confounding point that to a remarkable degree, people who came of age in the 1960s are now are still in positions of power. You know, one of the remarkable things about the 1960s was how young so many people were who were in positions of um, influence and sometimes ultimate authority. I mean, John Kennedy was the youngest man ever elected president of the youngest person ever elected president of the United States. Lyndon Johnson was only in his 50s when he was president of the United States, so we tend to kind of in our heads think of him as this older man. He wasn't. He was in his 19, he was in his 50s. Martin Luther King was in his early 30s. <laughs> you know, these were very an awful lot of people in powerful positions for very young people. And we now have kind of the exact opposite dynamic, that many of the people in positions of power are older and were people who grew up, came of age inside those very transformations that we've been talking about. Which does lead one to the conclusion, or at least I maybe the hope, that the only way out of all of this morass, essentially, is once a new generation does come of age. You know, I think the tricky part is that generations, I mean, think of it, and think of today's politics, um, both President Trump and President Biden, right, are in their 70s, actually in their late, late 70s. Late 70s, right. So, yeah, which means that there's an entire generation, there's two generations of people, right? I mean, there are the people who are in their 50s, Right. Um, who, and then there's a generation younger than that, but maybe three. I mean, I teach 20 year olds. You know, there's a huge range of people now who um, are waiting in the wings. And I don't know what that will look like when, or even which generation that will be that will step into positions of power. Is it fair to say? That, that if you look at the, this whole panoply of issues that we've been talking about, that the one constant going back to the 50s, even before, as you've talked about, and and going into today and even dealing with younger generations is the issue of race at the core of all of this. Yes. Well, I'll temper that just slightly. Sure. I do believe that race is at the core of the American dilemma, that there is no escaping the pervasive power of race in American society, and that has been the case throughout the American experience. To, I also think that from the end of World War II forward, we have also grappled with, um, to a greater or lesser extent, the enormous power of the American military and the American military's place in American society, and then, of course, in the shaping of international relations as well. So I think those two issues, I don't think they're of equal weight. I agree with you completely that race is a defining issue of this nation, and we have yet to find a way to address the enormous questions of race in a comprehensive way. It haunts us. How does economics play into all of this and, and wealth and prosperity? That's a terrific question. I think that what happened in the 1950s, and it was, a again, I want to stress that it was a very brief period in the 1950s. It wasn't even the entire 1950s that for a considerable amount of the American people, and again, a growing middle class, the upper end of the working class, and, that's, and of course, the well-to-do, enjoyed a level of prosperity they had never had before. I opened the book with a long story that I love, of a very ordinary family, white family in Chicago, who lived through the enormous changes, the enormous stresses and strains of the 20th century, and who finally, for this very brief period, has a sense of economic security they had never had before. They weren't rich people. They lived in a tiny little house on the west side of Chicago. 
But that was an enormous accomplishment, steady work, decent wages for ordinary people. That was true for a large segment of the American population in the 1950s. The problem, of course, was that it wasn't true for a lot of people who were excluded from that system. But it was real for those people more than ever before who enjoyed that sense of prosperity. And one of the things that happened in the 1960s is that that's one of the other cracks that opened, that suddenly that system of economic structures of prosperity, which were tied to military spending, in a very fundamental way, started to crack open. Those cracks widened and widened and widened in the 1970s, which is beyond my story, in the 1980s until we created, until the United States created a system of profound inequality, greater, far greater than what had existed in the 1960s, and a world of deep insecurity for millions and millions of Americans. And that's part of the great upheaval we see now in American society, is that so many more Americans feel unsure of their economic status, live in fear of losing a job, cobble together work in a gig economy. That's a different world than existed for an awful lot of white Americans, particularly, overwhelmingly, in the 1950s. And now we live with those consequences. Of course, the the one thing that came in between in that period in the 70s, and I mean, it certainly grew beyond that, was the overlay of educational attainment and, and the importance of college education, which added to the class divide to all of these other things that we're talking about. Yes, that's absolutely right. That in the story that I tell, that opening story that I mentioned a minute ago of this ordinary family, neither the husband nor the wife in that ordinary family had a college education. The wife didn't even finish high school. Um, and yet they were able to, in the economy of the 1950s, because they were white, because they had um, kind of upper working class status, because the husband was able to get a job in uh, it was a white collar job. He worked in a company that made coffee urns, um, some of them for the military, actually. They were able to live that secure, stable life because they had government programs to help them, Social Security, mortgage. He was a veteran. He got a good mortgage, had the ability to get a mortgage from the VA. And that phrase, that ability of someone with a high school diploma to build that safe, secure life did fray as the economy of the 1970s in particular, but I committed to the argument that the changes were, the underlying economic changes came from the 1960s, that as that transformed, as the economy transformed, as you're saying, into one where those manufacturing jobs and the jobs that came out of manufacturing faded away, and we created this really stark class divide where people can do extraordinarily well where people can live incredibly comfortable lives, but only through access to that kind of highly skilled economy. Your point is is obviously absolutely right about the the economic issues that evolved in the 60s. The, The battle over educational attainment and the importance of college education and what happened in the 70s was was like giving steroids to the 60s problem. That's exactly right. And then the shift in government policies that came in the 1980s and since then that pulled out some of the support systems that were there for more ordinary people contributed to that cycle, that steroid-driven transformation. When you wrote this, and particularly when you talk to young people, your students, about the 60s, do they understand that that there's this clear line, this lineage from all that we've been talking about to the issues that they see or read in the paper every day? They do. Well, I suppose I'm happy to say that they don't come in with that. They don't come into the class with that assumption. And, you know, I hate to say this second part as well, but, you know, my students were born, my youngest students, they're 18 years old. So they were born in 2003. Um, this is ancient history. You know, this is like their grandparents' history. <laughs> um, 
And so they come in, and one of the things that makes 1960s courses, courses on the history of the 1960s popular, is they come in with that kind of romantic sense, a lot of them. And my job is to take them to that point where they say, oh, this is more than kind of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. This is about the shaping of the world they are going to inherit. Maybe the rock and roll and the music is the way in for them to maybe understand this. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And I think, you know, that's kind of a, it's kind of fun to play around with, right? I do um, think that even there we have this kind of fascinating kind of nostalgic uh, reinterpretation of the music of the 1960s, you know? I mean, the, some of the most... I, once upon a time, I don't do this anymore, I used to um, play for the students the number one song in America, the number one hit in America in 1965. 65, I think. 65 or 66. It's the Monkees. <laughs> it's a musical group that they didn't play the instrument and it was created as a Saturday morning show for kids. <laughs> you know, and it was... I think it was probably a little unfair of me to have them interpreting the monkey's lyrics for their deeper meaning because they don't have any. <laughs> you know, so even then, you can play around a little bit with the kind of myth of the 60s that students will bring into the classroom. Kevin Boyle, his new book is The Shattering, America in the 1960s. Kevin, I thank you so much for spending time with us. This has been such an enjoyable conversation. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Thank you.